only a century and a quarter, our civilization, huddled along sea coasts and the shores of rivers, has moved along steel rails to the conquest of the great, rich, virgin American heartland. Rails carried the tools to carve a new empire, richer and more powerful than any history has known. And rails brought the hard-handed, dream-driven men to create the new cities. Chicago, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Omaha, Denver, Birmingham, Kansas City, Memphis. From the great marshalling yards of the subcontinent, the trains go forth weaving a network of parallel rails, four feet, eight and a half inches apart, and a quarter of a million miles long. The story of American railroads is the story of American growth. On July 4th, 1828, on the 52nd birthday of the United States, work began on the first American public railroad. Mighty stainless steel giants now span the country from the bustle of the industrial areas of the East across the span of the entire continent through the frightening grandeur of the Rockies. In minutes, passengers go comfortably through mountains that took many men, many painful years to pierce. And the toil and genius which penetrated the rocky spine of the continent brought the two oceans closer together and made of the land lying between one country. Each day to each American city, the freight brings food and warmth and luxuries, and the streamliner brings new men and new ideas and new growth. A train is a machine. It is made by men in factories. In the factories, problems are solved. But a solution means only that the next problem must be tackled as part of an unrelenting effort at improvement. The biggest problem on the first train was sealing the cylinders of the locomotive to keep in enough steam to drive the pistons. Now it's streamlining and better engineering for more speed, vista domes for a full view, more efficiency, more power, more comfort. Each year a train must do more and do it better. Now, a new tool, one of compactness and flexibility. A car of stainless steel, which is its own train, carrying its own power, self-contained. The engines move easily in or out for simpler maintenance. The car itself is designed to go anywhere and to operate where the transcontinental giants could not do so economically. abandoned because of the pressure of economics have reopened. Rights of way which for years have seen only an occasional local freight are busy again. Better service, new jobs. When the railroads do something new, it becomes part of the American landscape. So the rail diesel car has in a short time fitted itself to every varied vista, every contrasting horizon which is America from the waving cornfields of the Ohio River Basin to the endless miles of the desert, from the round hills of New England to the exotic scenes of Southern California, through the entire American expanse, there's a new way for men to travel.
and the old. The rail diesel car crosses the oldest railroad bridge in the country. New Haven has a line to Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where the Marine Biology Laboratory is, and where the ferry comes in from Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Summers, trains of these cars travel regularly from Boston to stop at the ferry slip. But even when the vacationers have gone home, single units still provide the year-rounders with good service. Once we moved down the Mississippi in flatboats, we traveled by stagecoach along the National Pike from Cumberland, Maryland to Vandalia, Illinois. We pulled our barges along the tow paths of the Erie Canal. But the problem of opening up America was unsolved. It remained unsolved until someone thought to take an engine which carried its own power and move it along rails to reduce the friction and guide its path. Among the piney sand dunes of South Jersey, between the surf of the Atlantic Ocean and the still waters of Delaware Bay, the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore runs a three-car unit into Tuckahoe. And both engines are running in each car, and the three pull smoothly together to the station. The train is split without endless backing and switching. One train moves in two directions, east and south, and two schedules are met. When railroading was younger, Spurs shot out from the main line in every direction, moving through the back country to small towns which depended on them for economic life. Lately, many of these have closed. As transcontinental railroading grew, local service found it often could not meet its costs. Now many of these abandoned spurs have been reopened, new veins in the economic bloodstream. known to history as a restless people, never content to stay put, always pushing forward and outward in search of better living or new surroundings, or seeking only the pleasure of continual movement. Of late, this restlessness has taken a new form. In recent years, there's been a great movement away from the city. Our tradition says we're a rural people, but the facts of our industrial life make us urban, so we compromise. Whoever can moves out to the country while continuing to work in the city. Thus the great American phenomenon, the commuter, leaving the city from work every evening in search of his private little bit of green. Up early every morning to travel the long way back to the city again and the place where he earns his living. Oh yes, we say, but it's worth the inconvenience. And then, not being a terribly logical people, we turn around and demand that there be no inconvenience. We demand more speed, more trains, more comfort and safety, which the railroads must provide or else. And the railroads often do provide. They have long learned it is better to keep their passengers happy than to lose them.
American rails have always depended more on the goods they carry than on the people they move. Even the passenger trains have always reserved important space for express shipments in the mails. The development of the one-car train has taken this into careful account. And where required, combination cars carry mail and express as well as passengers. This is Utah. Not far from here is Promontory Point, where the East first met the West by rail. And on May 10, 1869, gold and silver spikes were driven into the ties to commemorate the first transcontinental railroad. But history always builds its shrines and abandons them. The trains no longer go through Promontory, but cut right across the Great Salt Lake. The tracks with the gold and silver spikes have been torn up. History is fine, but only the new pays off. Today's problem must be solved with today's tools. The California Zephyr tying the Midwest to the Pacific. And the Zephyrette traveling the same rails on a different mission, not to bind together two halves of a mighty country, but to serve the small towns and way stations that lie between our large cities. The restless wheels of America are now on one car, moving swiftly and surely through a thousand miles of deserted vastness to small places where it fills the needs of a few people. America is growth and movement, striving and expansion. Its rails are its symbol, providing paths for its wandering, unifying its diversities. But even a symbol must adapt. As each day is met on its own terms, the rails are kept shiny by constant use, and the signal on ahead is clear iron.